Welcome to the Just Ingredients Podcast. I'm Cara Lynn, and here we talk all things nourishing to the mind, body, and soul. This is a place where you can find just good ingredients to life. The holiday season is here, and with it comes candle season. Have you ever stopped to think about what ingredients are in a candle? Have you ever seen a candle with the ingredients on its label? Most likely you haven't. The Fair Packaging and Labeling Act gives fragrance manufacturers a trade secret status, so they legally do not have to share their ingredients with you. Synthetic fragrance can contain up to 3,000 different chemicals, some of which are endocrine disruptors and respiratory irritants. Some even contain chemicals that are known carcinogens. If you do not want to give up candles forever, I have a swap for you. I love Fontana Candle Company for their 100% natural and independently certified non-toxic candles, wax melts, and room sprays. They use only pure beeswax, coconut oil, and essential oils in their candles, and they put all of their ingredients right on the label. Fontana was the first candle to be certified non-toxic by Made Safe. I love that they have my favorite seasonal scents like cinnamon orange clove, peppermint twist, and spice latte. Use podcast at FontanaCandleCompany.com for 15% off your order. Again, that's podcast at FontanaCandleCompany.com. Jonathan Curley has had a passion for agriculture since a young age. He started an apprenticeship as a young man with a renowned horse trainer and learned how to train horses for several years. His love for animals grew, and he started working on farms and ranches all over Utah. Shortly after being married, he had the opportunity to manage a large cattle ranch in Wyoming, where he started learning about regenerative agriculture. At the same time, he and his wife became passionate about health and nutrition and healing the body through food. This transferred over to their love of cattle and agriculture, which ignited a passion for learning how to raise grass-fed beef that was both tender and flavorful while incorporating sound, holistic nutritional practices for the animal. They realized the gap in availability of grass-fed beef for average families, so they moved back to Utah to start their dreams of raising delicious grass-fed beef. Welcome back to the show, everyone. I'm really excited today to have Jonathan on the show with us. Like you heard, he is a farmer, a rancher, and I've got a lot of questions to ask him about grass-fed beef and why his cattle are so amazing. And so welcome to the show, Jonathan. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. I appreciate it. Will you tell my listeners just a little bit more about yourself and your ranch that you have and just maybe how you got started in this? Yeah. So our journey into this has been, well, at least for me, has been one that's come over pretty much my whole life. So I I desired to be a farmer as early as I could remember. I remember um, being three or four or five years old, wanting to be a farmer, um, rancher, wanting to raise cows. So my love has started very, very early in my life, even though my family's background was not farming or ranching. Um, it was just something I desired. That led me to working with a horse trainer when I was like 10 years old. I went and apprenticed with a horse trainer and really instilled in me a love of animals. Um, from there, that love of animals just continued to grow and grow and grow, pursued me to taking jobs on different ranches, different farms. And so by the time uh, I was in my early 20s, I had actually started a custom farming business where we were actually doing custom hay work for people. We went and bought equipment and I didn't have a farm or ranch of my own per se, but we were doing it for other people all over the place. That journey led me into taking a job with a, a family that was trying to develop and build a ranch. Um, they were from Southern California and, and had this desire and actually contacted me and asked me if I would help them with this, with this project. That actually took my family. We moved to Wyoming at that point to, to help them with this starting this ranch. And that's kind of where everything started to really change for me as far as, you know, the, this family posed a question to me. They says, we don't want to do anything the normal way. Um, we want to, you know, we want to stop branding our cows. We want to stop giving them antibiotics. We want to stop giving them vaccines. We want to stop all this stuff. And, you know, at that point in my life is like, whoa, that's crazy. Why would you do that? And they didn't have a reason why. They just thought it made sense. Um, they thought it'd be better for the animals. Um, mm-hmm. And so I went along with it. And from there, 
began to learn a great deal about regenerative agriculture, about um, health and wellness for animals, about turning to grass fed um, versus traditional grain fed systems on beef. So that's kind of how we got into it. And we moved back to Utah to start our own meat business, our own place. Um, so we, we lease a bunch of land here in Wallsburg where we're at and have some um, property here uh, that we, we run on um, and have been loving it and loving the opportunity to continue to grow our, ourselves and to do this for our own people, you know, for our own family and for our friends and everybody else who would like it. And it's been a, it's been a great journey. Okay, so that's where your love for all of this came from was Wyoming then, because let's tell the listeners you own Prickly Rock Livestock. And uh-huh, that's correct. And on this ranch, I know you take such good care of those animals and feed them the best. And even with their wellness, you just really take care of them. And so that's where that love for all of this began was in Wyoming. It be- began, excuse me, before Wyoming, but it really kind of blossomed to where I could really see the potential and the ability to do things differently. So I should tell the listeners, we actually eat your meat. And I was just telling some people that we have tried so many different cows from different ranches throughout the years. And your meat really is the best. It is not gamey. It is tender. It tastes so good. So in a minute, I'm going to ask you why that is. But (laughs) before we begin... Why don't you just tell them how you raise your cattle and how it differs from conventional methods? So first, I mean, maybe we ought to, to say, you know, kind of an outline of just, just briefly of what conventional methods are. And, and I think that might give a basis to help understand what, why it's different. So in a, in a conventional kind of system raising beef, most calves are born on ranches and live there till about six months old, where they're typically sold to feedlots all over the country. From that point, you know, those six month, seven month old calves are um, put into feed programs according to age, weight, size, and they start going on these rations that are developed and designed to make them grow. And, and some would say almost unusually fast. Sometimes, you know, adding growth hormones, that's not unheard of in applications where there can be oftentimes used lots, lots of antibiotics. And so in those feed lots, they remain in these closed quartered systems until they're about 12 months to 18 months old when they're the right size to be killed. And so it's really kind of like a factory, you know, it's, it's all about efficiency and it's about productivity. It's about dollars in the end. And that's where most, the way, the way most beef in this country and even around the world is raised. So what, what changes for us is that um, we try and keep cattle on pasture, just native pasture. We're, to, we're talking about grasses that are natural, normal, nothing really un- crazy for as long, basically, a period of their life as possible. We have the, the disadvantage a little bit that we don't have as much ground to operate on as we would like. And so sometimes those pastures don't last us as long as we would like. Um, so from there, you know, when our pastures run out, we have to, to resort to buying and feeding hay. Um, that hay, you know, that's kind of a loose term, but that, that really is grasses for us, alfalfas for us is kind of the main types of feeds that we would feed. So then we take cattle from, it takes us longer. It takes longer, for example. So we're not, we can't make them grow faster, if you will, than they, than they will just grow. And so it takes a little longer. I mean, our, our animals are going to be more like two years old um, by the time they're finished. And so we have a lot more time, you know, with these animals and per se a, a conventional system. That- and from there, you know, these animals are basically going to be, they're not ever really confined. Um, they're always going to be able to move to roam. We take real interest in their actual nutrition levels. So this is making sure that they're getting adequate salt, adequate mineral, adequate protein, adequate fat even, and making sure that their feed sources have all those things. I was going to say the next thing that maybe sets us apart is that we like to add the, the sprouted barley um, into our rations. And for your listeners that maybe aren't familiar with that, sprouted barley is exactly as it sounds. It's barley seed that we source from a local here in Utah and sprout it and grow it. So it actually is, by the time we feed it, it's grass. It's uh, literally a living grass, about six to eight inches tall. And it forms this rooted seed mat and grass that's beautiful and green and lush. And we like to add that into our cow's rations about 100 days before 
they are processed. And that and that maybe is a little bit unusual or different than most farms and ranches, I would suspect. Okay, so the last 100 days, why do you feed them this um, sprouted barley? A lot of people, don't they feed different grains to the cattle for the last 100 days or so? Yeah, and in fact, a more conventional system, they're going to be on grain probably more like the last year of their life. Oh, okay. Um, six months to a year. So we're really not adding, in 100 days, we're not adding um, a lot of difference. We're just simply trying to give them a little extra right at the very end. And that's going to help them to continue to develop some fat, um, that intermuscular fat that everybody likes in their meat. Um, what we're doing is we're just trying to encourage that to finish off nicer and for the last 100 days. That's really all we're doing with our feed program there. Okay, so conventional farms, though, that is why they add grains in the last year, is to beef them up and give them some of that marbly fat, correct? That's correct. Yep, they're they're going for an animal that's growing and getting fat as quick as possible, right? So that, that's what grains are really good at, is that because they are such high energy, high starches, um, they're really good at providing high energy to those animals. And, and that's where those grains have an advantage. So the issue, though, is that some of these grains are GMO grains sprayed heavily with glyphosate. Is that the concern? It is. It is for us, certainly. I mean, it's probably our primary concern. Okay, so in these conventional farms, like I said, they eat grains that are GMO that we talked about that are heavily sprayed with glyphosate. Do you have an issue with glyphosate? Uh, yes. So one of the primary issues I have, be you know, aside from it just simply being poison, I mean, there's really no other way to put it. It's it's an antibiotic. Um, it's an anti-life, essentially. And it's, it's poison. It's, its whole purpose is to kill. So where I really take stock in this is that, you know, farmers, ranchers, they'll, they'll use glyphosate-based herbicides. They'll spray it on a crop to, to kill it, to harvest it, to kill weeds. Um, there's numerous ways that it's used. When it is used, um, it gets down into the soil and it kills the life of the soil. So the, that microflora, the, the biota, the, the fungi, the bacteria, all those things in the soil that are like a human gut, essentially, that it's just like the human GI system. It kills it just like an antibiotic does. What in return, what that does is that it makes it so that um, what's called nutrient cycling from plants to soil um, through photosynthesis actually ceases. It stops. It can't, it can't actually, um, the plant can actually not get the nutrients from the ground and the ground cannot get the nutrients from the plant. Hmm. What that does is leaves us with nutrient deficient food. And this is where it comes into our conversation is that that begins to affect our meat, um, our life and health of the cattle, and it affects our health <laughs> just as badly. Yeah, so interesting. I know how it affects our health, and I've talked to doctors about how it's affect our health, but it's really interesting hearing it from a rancher's perspective of how it affects the soil's health and the plant's health and then the meat's health, things like that. And so you guys don't use glyphosate obviously at all then no we i'm kind of a stickler on that i i probably threaten people that if they dare bring that near my property i'll i don't know what i do but <laughs> i wouldn't be very happy you know i'm i don't hate grains um i'm not an enemy like i don't i don't believe that grains are the enemy but certainly if you look at cattle and and if you look at how they they live in a in a native environment um grains aren't something that they would be able to have high access to you know there's a there's a quote from a, a gentleman in, in north dakota his name's gabe brown and, and is a true pioneer in regenerative agriculture but he he had a funny quote and that he said once he said you know i butchered a lot of animals and and a lot of these beef animals and he says i've still never been able to find a gizzard in one <laughs> and a gizzard is actually what birds have you know in order to be able to process and break down seeds and grains and so his whole idea is, is that, you know, in nature, he says these, some animals have been developed and evolved to, to really process and utilize these. And he goes, I've not been able to see that in beef cows. They're truly been designed and, and evolved to, to eat grasses and forages. And so really, we're just looking at how do we, how do we be in farming with nature um, and in the way that nature designed and, 
really these animals developed rather than than trying to do something that's more forcing it to change its natural behaviors. Well, for thousands of years, cows just grazed on the pastures and ate the grass. It wasn't until uh, more modern times that we started feeding them these grains to beef up, correct? And, and that is correct, yes. And so why did you choose sprouted barley, though? Is it, that not a grain? You know, barley is a grain. And again, this is where, you know, I, I come back to, I don't, I don't believe all grains are enemies, but how we use them, I think, is important. I believe that anytime, you know, we use a grain, we need to sprout it for humans, obviously fermenting it, you know, how, how do we use grains that, that make it so that it can be, the energy can be available, if you will. So when you use sprouted barley, for example, it makes the available nutrients for the cattle a lot higher. For example, you know, if you fed a whole seed of barley to a cow, And this is something interesting to think about when evolutionary is if you feed a whole seed to them, it'll actually come out of them pretty much unprocessed, unused. So a whole grain that's not been ground, um, cooked, um, some, some kind of processing actually almost has no use to that animal. So that's interesting. If you think about a grazing animal out in the native prairie, if they ate grasses that are grains, they're probably not going to really be getting that grain. It goes through and then gets replanted into the soil by their feet where it then turns into new grasses, right? That they can eat again. So the sprouting the barley turns it into a grass to where the the available nutrients goes from next to nothing to like 80 to 85% available nutrients in minerals and proteins and energies and, and sugars. All those things now all of a sudden become available for that cow to their digestion system to actually utilize and use. And that's why we like the sprouted barley. Um, is that it's a very lush, easy feed that we can feed that gives them lots of good energy and high nutrients quickly. Well, it's so interesting because our bodies as humans, we do better with nuts, seeds, grains when they're sprouted. That's why I teach about sprouting grains and things like that. So it's the same with the cows, right? It's just more nutritious as a sprouted grass rather than the actual grain. Absolutely. That's exactly perfect. So why don't you think more farms or ranches use sprouted barley? It's kind of expensive to do, to be honest. I think that's, if at the end of the day, it really always comes down to financial decisions and, and fear. Um, I hear a lot of times, you know, people are afraid to, to take steps that are different and unfamiliar. They're afraid of the results. And so sometimes I feel like we can, as people get stuck in this, this, mindset of fear. Um, and that fear really drives a lot of our decisions next to the economics of it. So the barley is expensive. I mean, it, it costs us a lot to run it. You have to have systems that are growing, have lights, have water, have electricity, and that all can add quite a bit more to your actual overall operating costs. Therefore, you know, reducing your profits and that, and I think that's probably fear in that or probably in my opinion, the reason why you don't see it. Well, that goes with all foods. It really comes down to the profits. And there's the companies that only care about the profits. And there's the companies that want to provide you the better option. And so um, you see it on the ranches as well. Yeah, absolutely. You do. Okay. So then let's talk about your cattle. Are they considered 100% grass fed, even eating the sprouted barley? Yeah, the, the National uh, Grass Fed Institute, I believe it is, they they actually in their website listed sprouted barley as being grass fed. So, you know, that doesn't really mean a lot to me. I don't really worry about the national grass fed Institute, but in my mind, it's a grass, you know, when I feed it to them, I I know what grass looks like and, and it's grass. And so for me, you know, it's, it's no longer a seed. It is a living growing grass that yes, I I feel hundred percent, you know, confident and okay saying this is a hundred percent grass fed, even, even though it is barley grass. And I've seen your ranch and I've seen cows just out on the pastures. You can watch them, you guys, on Instagram and you'll see the pastures and the cows roaming out there. So you know that they're out there just eating the grass and then you finish them, like you said, the last 100 days with this barley. So tell my listeners, is there really a benefit to 100% grass-fed beef? Yeah, this is a great question. One that I think is 
very debated um, across our country right now. But yes, I mean, there is numerous studies and numerous evidence that that shows that um, grass fed beef is higher and in almost all nutrients, um, especially that the more notable is the fat ratios, the omega three to the omega six ratios become more balanced, more like they should be, you know, like, like you would want to see. So it's interesting, you know, and when I look at that, I see nature being able to provide us balances of nutrients that is optimal where sometimes when we get so smart as man, and we think I'm going to change things and, and do this differently. Um, sometimes we like mess up the balances. And so in all the nutrient factors that you can, that you can trace in beef, um, they almost all are higher. The next really interesting thing is that the availability of those nutrients. So, so our, our body's ability to use those nutrients increases for some reason. It's a, it's an interesting little phenomenon that when we feed them a more natural diet, we can actually use those nutrients better. And so, yeah, it, it, when you look at it, you know, on a scientific wise, there's not a lot of difference. It doesn't look a lot different from grain fed to grass fed, but there are just these subtle little changes that I think make the difference. It's so interesting because 100% grass-fed beef, the studies show that it could be like five times more omega-3s. And it's interesting that today a lot of us are really low on omega-3s. And so I'm like, if we just go back to how cows were supposed to be roaming and living off of the grass from the pastures, maybe we'd all have better omega-3 levels. Yeah, absolutely. It is. a. It's very interesting. Okay, so not a, is it only better for humans? Is 100% grass fed healthier for the cow? Absolutely, 100%. So, does 100% grass fed beef impact the quality of the meat also that they produce? It's a little bit interesting, you know, um, relation here is that most people that you talk to would say, you know, grass fed is not good meat. You know, it's dry, it's bland, it's you hear that a lot. And, and that's probably the, one of the number one things I hear when people talk about grass fed is that it, it's eating quality is just really poor. And that's, that's a big concern, especially, you know, when we're raising grass fed meat, you know, it, it's, it's something that I really am. I'm concerned about is like, when you get this meat, is, is it going to be something you actually want to eat? You actually enjoy eating. And so that's a big factor. But what we found is that the two aren't exclusively different. So grass fed can be just as enjoyable, just as good but it, but it has to be done differently. So for example, if you try and, you know, take a, a cow and you put it in a conventional method and you just take its grain away and all it eats is grass, but it's killed at the same time as all of its, all the others, y- you might have some issues, you know, that you actually might have some meat quality that changes and isn't as good because that animal's not been allowed to mature. And once they mature is when they develop, truly develop fat of their own nature. And so the grass fed, you know, it allows the animal to live a natural life cycle where their bodies do things when they're supposed to. So in an, you know, in a, in a cycle of an animal, they put on fat for winter. And so they go all summer developing, storing fat. And then that's actually a reserve for winter um, performance. And so when we're harvesting meat, you know, we kind of want to look at that when we're doing grass fed meat, we need to allow that animal to mature to get old enough that it actually begins to put on fat stores like it would typically do for winter um, or in return for breeding. Um, Those are all really important factors. Fat is for both survival winter and breeding. And those things only happen when that animal is allowed to be normal, when it's allowed to do things on its own timelines. So that's what grass feeding animal truly on a native grass pastures um, allows them to live in that kind of a, a system, if you will. Oh, that's so interesting. Okay, so do you think that that's maybe the difference? Because I've bought grass-fed cows before that are very gamey and tough. And then when I ate yours, it was not gamey. There's fat marbling in it, and it's delicious and tender. So is that the difference then? You know, it's hard. It's hard, a little bit hard for me to speak on all these other, you know, people doing grass-fed because I'm not 100% sure what their programs are. But it certainly seems like in my mind, as I've studied the question, looked it over, that that is very potentially a real part of this. You know, it it seems like it has to be a real part of what's going on here is that we're not allowing these animals to mature. We're not allowing them to put on their fat reserves 
naturally and normally. And that's what we're really trying to focus on here is, is how do we allow these animals to do just that? Okay. That's good to know. So tell me this, does grass fed cows have anything to do with sustainability? So there's a lot of ways that this, this question is true. So, so one, one perspective that we, we could look at, and this is, comes from more of the dairy side of the world. When you look at dairy cattle, for example, a lot of them eat a very high grain diet, um, very high energy diets, but their life expectancies are not very high. You know, five years to 10 years max versus if you go back to more heritage breeds of beef cattle um, that all kind of cattle stem from, they have life expectancy rates of 20, 25, 30 years. So in some ways, through our breeding and through our feed that we've chosen to do, we've cut the life expectancy of cattle almost in half. But another perspective of that is that when you have true grass-fed grazing systems, there's a huge environmental benefit. And it's something that, you know, in, in politics you, and in the world, you hear a lot of people claiming beef has a major issue in, for example, global warming right. or uh, other issues. Well, when you look at a true grass-fed system, that really, the whole the whole thing changes. In fact, that actually has the ability to sequester carbon back into the soil. So cattle are actually strategic and important in its ability to actually reverse a carbon excess in the environment. It actually has the ability to bring that back into the soil. And, and that's really amazing. Well, that is because that's not what you hear like on the news and things. It is not. There's so much science to show that agriculture done right has the ability to make the changes that we need to see in our um, environment. So that's another way that grass-fed beef is actually truly a help to in sustainability. Um, you, so you see animals with healthier animals that live longer. You see sustainability in our environment. And the list probably could go on and on. There's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of ways and a lot of reasons that that question is true. That's so interesting because you hear all the time on social media that the cows are the problem, you know, especially with global warming. So, yeah. So, and, and you know, there's a, there's a great book that if, if anybody is interested in really diving into that subject, the name of the book is actually Defending Beef. It's a, it's a very interesting read actually. And it, it dives into all the science and all the research revolving around that question. So if any, you know, if any of your listeners are actually interested in really diving into that, there's, there's a lot of really good resources to, to answer those questions. Okay. That's good to know. Uh, let me move on to another topic because this is one that's controversial as well. And I hear a lot about uh, hormones and antibiotics. Let's start with hormones. Are hormones still given to cows? Yes, they are. You know, there's, there's been more regulations come out on them there for a while. They became really, really widely used. And then it seems like they've kind of dropped off and changed a little bit, but yes, antibiotics, sorry, hormones are still used and you know, they've got a lot of controversial around them. Some people say it's fine. Some people say it's not simply put, you know, I take the argument I've been making all along that when we take the animal out of nature and out of its normal cycles and its normal environments, there's always consequences you know, there's consequences every time. And so when I look at that pattern, um, I don't have all the evidence and all the science to say if it is or it isn't right. But the pattern suggests that it's not normal. It's not natural. And therefore there are consequences. Okay. That makes sense. So were the hormones being given purely for growth aspects? In probably the application we're talking about, yes. There are hormones given to cattle, for example, in the dairy industry to um, change their cycling for breeding purposes. And so that would be probably one of the other places that hormones are used in in the cattle industry. I do know that they have been reduced a lot in the ranching industry. And so that Mm -hmm. I am grateful for. So let's talk about antibiotics. Is there a time and a place for antibiotics? Do you guys use antibiotics? What's your take on that? I probably haven't given an antibiotic to a cow for years now. Oh, wow. Um, It's been a long time. I I honestly can't really remember the last time I gave antibiotics to an animal. But yes, there are time and a place for them. You know, I've had calves in the past that 
a, a round of antibiotics saved their life. So I would rather have an animal that's alive than dead. Obviously, as a ran- you know a rancher, that's profit profitability. But there are concerns for me. You know, does that animal go back into a beef system? Um, for us, it probably wouldn't because we're really trying to make sure that our animals are. We can actually say tell people that have never had antibiotics. So if we needed to save the life of an animal, it would probably just go to an auction barn or be sold for breeding stock or, or some other purpose. Now, antibiotics have a withdrawal dates, you know, that when you look at them, they say, hey, as long as you have this animal off these antibiotics for 50 days or 70 days, it should be safe. I don't know if I believe that because I know the harm that antibiotics have in people and it lasts a lot longer than 50 days. Right. So when I look at that with cattle, there's no, there's not really any studies or evidence that people are not really getting into that right now. But when you consider what it does to people, I have to assume it does the same to them. And I think that that effect is a lot longer lasting than um, currently is suggested. I know that you guys take such good care of those cows. And in fact, one time we were talking and didn't you tell me that you even have tried essential oils a few times for different things with the cows? Yes, we have. So primarily, you know, it's, it's not something we, we use all the time. It's definitely not like a standard practice, but uh, we're always looking for new ways to, to try things. Uh, and one of which we've used essential oils is actually in the healing of wounds. When there's a wound on an animal, it needs to be healed. We've also used them in practices trying to figure out uh, more natural dewormers to help deworm our cattle. Um, so so there we've played with them and, and we're always looking for new ways to to try and make things better. And so essential oils have been a part of that, even though it's not something we, we do um, all the time. Well, I love that you guys are just willing to try, you know, different treatments, different routes, different holistic ways for the benefit of your cows. Yeah, it, it's it's a, it's a, always an experiment. It keeps things interesting, always. So interesting. Okay, so I want to know how you keep your uh, cattle so healthy that you don't need to give them antibiotics. Well, in part, it's being on pasture, right? Being able to be cows, being able to be out in their environment is huge. Um, Secondly is the nutritional aspects of it. You know, in our day and age, pretty much everything is nutrient deficient. Everything from the ground, the soil, um, that affects our grass, that affects our cows, that affects us. And so one thing that we're really trying to change and really focus on is how do we improve the life of our soils to improve the life of our grass, to improve the life of our cows. And so each decision we make on this ranch and and what we're doing affects that question of the health of those animals. The next thing is because of that, we have to make sure that we're always supplementing quality uh, minerals. We do that primarily in the form of salt from Redmond. We really like Redmond's products and, and use a lot of them. Oh, the I cattle seem to really, really um, lean to it. They, they prefer it actually. Interestingly, we've done a lot of side-by-side comparisons of salts and they really do prefer it. So we try and make sure that they really have the, the minerals that they need. You know, I've seen, for example, years ago, I had a cow herd that come summer, they didn't lose their winter hair and they were just really mangy, just really rangy looking. I mean, they were awful looking. They're Normally, you know, a healthy cow loses its hair and becomes really shiny and clean and they look really pretty out in the pasture. And this group just did not. And so we did some research um, and determined that we needed to increase cobalt, copper, um, zinc, and selenium. And so we did those things. We, We got a mineral package formulated and we started feeding that to them. And it was interesting to see, you know, within 30 days, that whole cow herd change. Um, wow. From that time, I, re- I, I learned the lesson how important, you know, minerals are and making sure the the balance of minerals in your cow herd is, is incredibly important. And so that's something that we really try and keep in mind and focus on. And it seems like there's a lot of issues that can be fixed just simply by making sure that they're eating right and that they're getting what they need as far as those minerals that may be lacking. This is so fascinating to me because as you're talking, I'm thinking, well, this is the same for humans. Um, You're saying, yeah, when I say, how are they not sick? You're saying, well, they're out in nature like they're supposed to be. They're eating what they're supposed to be. We're watching their nutrients. We're watching their minerals. And that's the exact same for humans. Like, how do you boost your immune system or strengthen it, support it? Well, 
being out in nature is great. Eating the foods that you're supposed to, the nutrients, the minerals, things like that. And so it's so amazing how it's for the animal and the human as well. It, it really is. And that's something that we've learned more and more as, as, you know, as we study the health of our bodies, we keep asking, like, how can we actually apply that to our cows? Hmm. Um, and a lot of our decisions for our cows have actually changed as we've changed the way we view our bodies. And so that's actually helped us as we've gone down this journey of trying to make these decisions with our beef herd is sometimes dependent on how we actually have learned what about ourselves and our own health. Well, that's so interesting. I can tell that because you talked about that with the antibiotics, because we know it can mess with our gut and a lot of things in humans for years and years. And so when you said like, it's not out of the humans in 50 days, why would it be out of the cows? There you are relating the humans to the cows and their wellness. Exactly. I love that. And I love you guys. If you watch them on Instagram, they really do love and care for their animals. And I just think that's amazing. I wish all ranchers did that. Okay. So question for you. When people are at the grocery store, is there a way to know if they're buying quality meat or not necessarily? That's a tough question because Conventional agriculture really has had a detriment to our um, agricultural systems all the way around the board. Everything from it's not just meat, it's it's everything in the grocery store. So it, it I feel like that is hard. It's hard to make good choices anymore when you have a system that is really, truly failing us. You know, how do you choose good options? The first recommendation I would make is buy from grocery stores that are buying from local ranches. Um, and, and there are several around that are doing that. And I think that that's one, it's, it's helpful to your, the local economies of those ranches and farmers. And two, it's going to be your best option to make sure that you're getting um, high quality meat because it, the more local, typically the less issues, or you could say foul practices or bad practices are being implemented. Right. Um, the more local you go typically. I love that. And I tell people like, get to know your local farmers or ranchers. They might be hours from you, but there's ways to get their meat. You guys are over an hour from us. Mm -hmm. Um, But by buying local or small like that, you get to know like what they feed them and how their, what their practices are. And that's how we got to know you guys is by, you know, buying your meat and asking you guys a lot of questions. So I really push that like, okay, we've got to get over this idea that everything has to come from the grocery store. We can take a little time and effort to, you know, find the small local ranchers, farmers around us and educate ourselves and support them. Well, and on a plus side of that, it'll be better for your pocketbooks. I mean, you usually end up saving money in the end. And, and the other benefit is that the farmers and ranchers actually benefit more. There's, there's more profitability for those farmers and ranchers that way. So to me, it's kind of a win-win for the consumer. It's a win for the producer. It, I really love that. I think that is a great way to do it. I agree. Okay. So now let me ask you about the grocery store. Sometimes you'll see a hundred percent grass-fed beef. Sometimes you'll just see grass-fed beef. Is grass-fed beef, when it doesn't say a hundred percent, just sort of a scam? Well, you know, here's an interesting thing, you know, is pretty much all beef in the world is you could call grass fed, you know, almost there's no, probably not a cow out there that doesn't spend most of its life eating a grass based forage, at least Mm -hmm. for a portion of its life, whether that's while it's a calf, whether it's at some point in its life, it's going to be eating grass. And so grass fed seems kind of like a nice little marketing term but it doesn't mean grass fed or grass finished per se. It just simply means it's eaten grass. So at some point of their life, they've eaten a few little bits of grass, maybe. Exactly. So, you know, if you're buying there um, and you want, you know, a person really wants grass fed, grass finished hundred percent of their life, they're going to need to be looking for that on those packages and those labelings. Okay. Good to know. So how do we get more farmers to jump on board with how you, or ranchers, I should say as well, to jump on board with this more back to the nature type mentality of letting the cows just eat the grass that has not been sprayed with glyphosate, you know, letting them do what nature wants them to do? You know, that's a, that's a great question because agricultural producers at some point 
have to take, start taking responsibility for their actions. Um, and I'm never one to try and diss on agriculture. You know, our farmers and our ranchers across the country are great, great people and truly mean the best. You know, I, I haven't met a single person who's like, I just want to poison people by using bad products. Right. And so with that in mind that, you know, these are good people, but also we have to take responsibility for what we're doing. And that's a big issue is that there's not responsibility being taken one by federal governments uh, around the world and by the farmers using the products. And so this is where consumers really need to get to know their farmers and let them know how they feel. Cause that's, what's going to change their minds is, is when those buying the products say, we don't want it. We don't like it. Then the next is helping education. So interesting, you, you know, farmers have actually forgotten how to farm. You know, we've been a few generations now of farmers that don't know how to do anything, but till the ground and use glyphosate, you know, we, they, that's all they know how to do. And we've really forgotten how we farm with nature and how we use nature to heal itself, how we allow nature to heal. And that's what used to be practiced and used to be done, but we've forgotten it. So there really needs to be an education of farmers, ranchers alike all over the world to reteach holistic regenerative practices that will allow our earth and our all over the world to be inhaling. And so it's really, it comes down to education. And I think those changes again, come down to fear. You know, we're, we're afraid to make, make those changes because we're not familiar. We're un, we don't have the education or the confidence to make them because, and, it, and that lends to a lot of fear, I think. That's so interesting that you say that, because just like we were talking earlier about the human body being so similar to the cow, meaning of how we heal and nurture it and nourish it, you're talking the same thing. Like, I feel like humans have sort of forgotten how to heal their bodies, how to use nature and nourishing foods to help them the most in the same way that the farmers aren't educated on how to best use their practices to nourish the food as much as possible. That, that's exactly right. It, you know, I'm often amazed how similar everything I study ends up becoming, whether I'm studying the soil health or cattle health or human health or even human psychology for that matter. However, no matter what I study, it always comes down to the same principles and healing off always seems to look the same everywhere we turn. Um, and so more and more, and I'm con- thoroughly convinced that we just simply have to, to try and heal our bodies, our minds our world, our animals, um, healing is really just necessary in our day and age um, and possible. That's what's exciting to me is that it's so possible and so fast. Um, when a farmer turns to regenerative practices, the ground can change um, in a matter of weeks and it, it's fast. I mean, our world, it's just resilient and it's, a, it's a phenomenal to me how fast those changes can be made. Oh, I love that thought. And that's so interesting. So as we wrap up here, any tips that you would like to give the listeners about buying meat or healing or being on the ranch, anything like that? That's a great question. So buying meat, I just say, be careful, be conscientious, buy from, buy from the farmers, the ranchers that you trust, get to know them. I think that that's really important. And then enjoy it. You know, I believe beef is a superfood. It's, it's full of so many good things that we just can't get other places um, almost anymore. And so I'd say get to know the farmer, buy the meat and enjoy it and love it. And by doing that, I feel like it blesses our lives when we can enjoy what we're eating and we can love what we're eating. I think that really brings a lot of happiness and blessings into our life. I love that. It's a good relationship with food, I think. And, and that's what we're after. Such a good thought. Okay, tell my listeners where they can find you and where they can order um, your beef and your products. Like you said earlier, Prickly Rock Livestock is our um, ranch name. And our website um, is pricklyrocklivestock.com. And so that's probably to order the best place for us is it makes it very easy, um, easy for people to order. And so that's probably the best place to go right now. And we sell um, beef and we actually also sell lamb. Um, that's probably less known. Most people don't know that, but we, we, do, we, we do sell some lambs and all the same principles, you know, that we've talked about beef, they apply just straight over to those lambs too. And, I, and we do raise them the same way. 
I actually didn't know you do lamb. I know my beef order is coming soon, so I'll have to remember that for my spring order. There you go. Yeah, we 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 actually raise a breed from England um, called Texel, and they've been a really nice um, sheep for us. We really enjoyed having them, and their eating quality is is excellent as well. So, oh, that's amazing. Yeah, I'll have to try that. So I always end my podcast with asking my guests what they have found to be the best ingredient in life. What would you say it is? I love this question. Um, As we've listened to your podcasts, uh, my wife and I both, we actually love listening to this part. It's one of my favorite parts of your podcast. I feel like this is such a tough question for me because I feel like there could be so many answers. But to me, it really, I think, would come down to relationships. First and foremost, our relationship with God, who we are. Um, our relationship to ourselves. And then secondly, you know, the relationships with our families, um, mine, especially my wife, you know, that relationship's very vital and important to me. Um, and, and obviously that trickles down to a family and friends. And But I think those relationships are, are truly why we're doing everything we're doing. It's why I farm. It's why I ranch. It's a calling I feel. And I feel like it's because of my relationship with my father in heaven, with my wife and with my family that I feel that calling. I love that. And I would add for you, your relationship with your cattle and your animals, because I've seen, yes, I seen how you guys treat those animals and you guys just love them and your kids love those animals. And so you have shown that relationships are important in all aspects of your life, including those with the animals as well. Very much so. Yes, that is, it is, you get to know those animals and you, and you, you get to love them in a way. Well, thank you so much for being here. And you listeners, go follow them on Instagram. They're a fun follow. But also, if you're looking for like a half cow to buy and purchase and store in your freezer, I promise you, you will not be disappointed with theirs. Like I said, I've tried many cows over the years and yours has been our favorite. So that's why we've stuck with you guys for the last few purchases. So thank you, Jonathan. We appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, for all that you do on the ranch, social media, teaching other ranchers, teaching us. And thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. It was my pleasure to be here and get to visit with you. This is our passion. So we're great, grateful for it. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Remember to subscribe to the Just Ingredients podcast to learn more about your health and good ingredients to life. Plus, get daily tips at just.ingredients on Instagram. 